I'm joined now by Juliet Hooker. She's a political scientist at Brown University who specializes in black political thought. And last year, she published a book called Black Grief, White Grievance, The Politics of Loss. And it's got a lot to tell us about the current political moment, as well as some of the roots of this argument over the word woke. Mm -hmm. Juliet, welcome to Notes from America. Thanks for having me. So we just heard a rendition of the song Lead Belly wrote about the Scottsboro Boys, which, as I said, is um, the context in which he said stay woke for the first time. We believe that's where he coined the phrase. Can you put the Scottsboro Boys case into a little more context for us? What, why is it so important? So as you mentioned earlier, of course, it went through many um, trials and retrials. And one of the things that it did was that it um, ended up enshrining a lot of uh, rights for criminal defendants, especially black defendants, because it led to the outlawing of de facto exclusion of African Americans from juries, which was happening in Alabama at the time because they were based on voter rolls. And as we know, African Americans were disenfranchised after Reconstruction. Um, it was also something that galvanized African American communities in the South, and people formed local committees to help defend the Scottsboro Boys. And Rosa Parks, for example, gets her first foray into activism working on the defense of the Scottsboro Boys. It's this catalyst event in so many ways yeah. that I think a lot of people don't know about, right? I mean, how, how, much, how, how much do you think people are aware of, the, of these boys' case? You know, there are these iconic events, right? So there's the, um, the funeral of Emmett Till, there's the Scottsboro Boys case that really lead up to the Civil Rights Movement, but I feel like you're right that the Scottsboro Boys case has kind of fallen a bit off the radar in comparison to some of these others. All right. In one of Dr. King's last published works, it's called Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, he kind of grapples with the state of the civil rights movement and his aftermath. Talk to me about his mindset before his death and what you think was on his mind mm -hmm. thinking about the civil rights struggle. Yeah, so that is a fascinating text. And he writes it after the Watts uprisings, right? And the, all of the critiques of sort of black rioting and black violence that are that is happening at the time. And he's also spending um, you know, half of his time living in Chicago and leading protest marches there to protest racism in the North, school segregation, poverty. And he writes about how, you know, one year ago after the Civil Rights Act was um, went into law, the same activists are marching in Chicago and getting pelted with bottles, right. um, jeered by thousands who are carrying Nazi signs. So he's trying to grapple with like, what is this moment in US history and what is happening? And he basically says, you know, um, w there is a narrative that's forming that the, the Watts uprisings are leading to racist backlash. But he's like, no, the backlash started as, you know, before it started as soon right. as people saw that there was gonna be black advancement and then there's white resistance. Right, and so, which is to say the grievance came first. Uh, the, this is a question that may irritate you as a, a, a scholar and somebody who cares about history, but in the modern context, would you call Dr. King woke? Oh, great question. Um, if by woke we mean, um, you know, aware of and critical of racism, definitely. You know, um, as um, we know, um, he was, you know, he had these, um, you know, he was a Southern preacher, so not in terms of perhaps some of the things related to openness, to sexuality, gender that we might associate with it. But certainly I think in terms of a radical vision of what racial justice would require in the United States, I mean, the later king is the king of the poor people's campaign who's focused on economic inequality. It's also the king who's denouncing U.S. militarism, you know, so he's definitely much more radical, I think, than he's often portrayed as being. Romanticized as being one might yeah. even say, yeah, it's okay to clap. <laughs> and, and you point out in your book that there is often this criticism of how black people mm -hmm. protest, experience rage, um, and that it comes from a romanticization of the civil rights movement in the mm -hmm. first place. Can you say more about that? 
Absolutely. So we now have this narrative of the civil rights movement, right? You had these well-dressed, you know, well-spoken protesters. They protested peacefully, and so their demands were sort of somehow immediately met. And we know that's not what happened. And one of the things that that, of course, um, you know, leads to is this critiques of current protesters saying, you're not following the model of the civil rights movement. You're making people uncomfortable. You're, you know, do, you're engaging in looting or violence or this or the other. And what that doesn't take into account is that the whole point of the civil rights movement was to make people uncomfortable. It was to create conflict. I mean, they responded peacefully, but the point was to- Was disruption. Those disruption. Oh, yeah. And so then how, and so that romanticization you feel like is, it, is, is a, is a core hindrance to organizing today, or maybe not to organizing today, but for people hearing what organizers have to say today? I don't think to organizing, but to how people respond to organizing, right? Um, in the sense that people are often critical of contemporary right. activists saying, you're not following the model right. of the civil rights movement. But then that doesn't take into account the fact that even when people protest peacefully, it's, that doesn't mean that their protests are taken, you know, are somehow, yeah. um, responded to correctly. So if you think about athletes kneeling, the most peaceful protest you can make and people <laughs> were still on a knee. <laughs> yeah, and people were still super critical right, of right. those. It, your book argues that there's these two big forces mm -hmm. that divide politics in the United States today, mm -hmm. black grief and white grievance. Mm -hmm. So um, just to like lay it out, let's talk about those two bu those two buckets first. Let's start with black grief. So by black grief, I mean the way in which black people have suffered losses continually over the course of US history. And they've had to respond to those losses often by mobilizing to gain justice for their loved ones who were killed by violence. Um, and so this has meant that there's this tradition in, um, in black politics of grief, death, being this catalyst for activism. Right? If you think about the funeral of Emmett Till, if you think about the movement for black lives, right? it was this, these moments of, of outpouring of grief and anger that people then channel into politics in order to try to create change. Right. And then for the white grievance part mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So white grievance, it, I think of as a form of um, anticipatory loss, right? So there's this, the other side of, of black people facing disproportionate loss is that white people have not, as a group, had to face as much. And so they often respond to gains by other groups by feeling displaced. So if you think about the response, some people agree with that <laughs> sentiment, um, of all lives matter as a response to black lives matter. Right? Um, that's because, oh, this isn't some about me. And so this sense of displacement, of being displaced by other people seeking to um, you know, have their rights upheld, I think is what leads people to see themselves as victims and mobilize in terms of these rhetorics of resentment, yeah. grievance. And you, kept, you opened the book talking about January 6th yes. um, as a kind of classic example mm -hmm. of these two things, black grief and white grievance playing out. Just kind of spell out how you see these two things on that day. Well. I mean, one thing that many people pointed to on that day is the, sort, the kid glove treatment that was accorded to the um, January 6th insurrectionist <laughs> in comparison to how Black Lives Matter protesters had been treated in Washington, D.C., right? Um, and we see this now with people trying to whitewash what happened. I mean, an actual insurrection and calling it, oh, people were just being tourists visiting the Capitol, right? And on the other hand, there are also, you know, there are also people who will say things like, you know, Black Lives Matter protests are, are about looting, they're about violence, it doesn't matter what happened in the protest. There's this assumption that, you know, there's something illegitimate about trying to get justice for black people. We, we, typically, we typically take calls as part of our show. We've asked our audience here at the Apollo to submit questions um, instead of our callers. And Julius here asks a two-part question, but one I want to ask you about, is it possible to be too woke 
too mm. consumed and paranoid. Um, and as a student of black political thought, mm -hmm. I do wonder this question, I mean, you know, you've studied the Marcus Garvey mm -hmm. movement, you've studied mm -hmm. some of the, it, taking that, that question mm -hmm. seriously, is there, is, mm -hmm. is there a place where it becomes a problem for a racial justice or a social justice movement? So that's an interesting question. I think one thing that I would say is, I mean, it depends on, on what we're talking about. So if you mean, you know, in terms of the, the personal consequences of feeling like you're always aware of, you know, of the ways in which you're experiencing racism, sexism, all these things. I mean, part of the problem is you can't really turn that off, right? right? And, and some people do respond by saying, I'm just going to try to block it out and then then they realize, no, I can't, because you suffer some incidents of racism or sexism. Um, I think as a movement, I think, you know, if we're talking in terms of movements, I think often for movements, it's used to say you're trying to go too far too fast. But, you know, um, MLK used to say, right, um, racial justice is always untimely. There's never a right time to be Shut trying up. to... <laughs> <laughs> it is always an inconvenient thing mm -hmm. uh, to, to think about mm -hmm. justice. I also gather uh, you're saying that you want to move us out of this, this binary, black, mm -hmm. grief, white, grievance, that both of them ha are narrowing of the imagination. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean about that? So I think on, you know, on the white grievance side of it, I think that there is the sense that it leads to a kind of zero-sum thinking, right? So not all white people, but some white people feel like if other groups are gaining rights, that's taking something away from them. And so they always have to be opposed to that, even when they might gain from the same policies. If you think about something like expanding Medicare, right, which people end up opposing because they see it as somehow benefiting other groups more than whites. Um, the other thing on the black side, I think, you know, there is a tradition in, um, in black political thought where I think um, black thinkers and activists have taken on this, um, the sense that, um, you know, it is incumbent on them to try to change U.S. democracy, to try to take on this burden. Um, so Mamie Little Mobley, right, for example, mm -hmm. talked about the, after the death of her son, about feeling called by God to become an activist. And, um, and, and it was heroic what she did, and we can, you know, we can celebrate the hero, heroism of people who take on these roles while also thinking about the cost of that activism. You think about somebody like Erica Gardner who ends up dying young of a heart attack after taking on this role of activism yeah. after the death of her father. And we can also ask what obligations do we have towards people who are grieving whom we are asking to become activists. I want to turn to the current battleground over wokeness, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is higher education. The most recent news is surrounding Claudine Gay, the former president of Harvard. Mm. She recently resigned her position uh, following a congressional hearing about free speech on college campuses, mm -hmm. but specifically uh, surrounding the debate over Israel's bombardment of Gaza. And the details of her story are winding, and I think well trod at this point. We won't go back mm -hmm. over them, but they include us, you know, accusations that she was not tough enough on an, an anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. uh, and some attacks on her scholarship, which I think notably focuses on racial representation in positions of power. What does all of this, this moment around Claudine Gay, tell you um, as someone who is sitting in higher education studying racial mm -hmm. justice? What does this tell you about the culture war in higher education right now? So it's extremely disappointing. I think what we're seeing is um, people really weaponizing these concerns about anti-Semitism and, you know, about plagiarism, but it's not really about that. And they're using it, I think, in order to really attack higher education. Higher education itself. Higher education itself, because it started with the public universities where a lot of states, right, were making all of these um, state legislatures, were really trying to clamp down on what was happening in public education, and now they're going to after private education. I think one of the, things, one of the reasons that that's happening is because higher education teaches people critical thinking skills, and it teaches you accurate history. 
Did, did you see this coming? I mean, it, from inside mm-hmm. academia, is this moment a surprise to, to folks who do the kind of work you do? Or I don't think it's a su- surprise. I think we, you know, we're in a moment where there is greater visibility of scholars of color on college campuses. I think that's seen as a threat by people who feel like particularly elite institutions should be dominated by white, straight men. Um, I think it's also the case that we've seen these attacks on higher education for a while now, and, um, and they're really about, you know, taking away the ability of people to really identify misinformation, to really um, respond to some of the wave of, of, of lies and misinformation that we're awash in right now. We have to go to break in a minute, but is, has it had a chilling effect, you think? I think so. I think people are very concerned about what they can say. I mean, people are saying very clearly that donors want to, uh, private institutions want to be able to to have a same faculty hiring. They want to have a same promotion. I mean, this tells you, toe the line or we're going to come after you. We need to take a break. This is a special edition of Notes from America. We're celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Day at the historic Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. I'm talking with Brown University political scientist Juliet Hooker, who is author of the book Black Grief, White Grievance, The Politics of Loss. 